Hello, and welcome to the Drug Discovery World podcast. My name is Giles, and I'm here to take you through another topical and insightful article from Drug Discovery World. Today's episode is taken from an article in our winter 2016-17 issue, and is part two of two episodes. So if you haven't listened to the previous episode, it's worth going back and listening to that one first. This episode is titled Translational Chemical Biology, Gap Assessment for Advancing Drug Discovery, Development and Precision Medicine, Part 2. The article was written by Dr. Mukund Chogard, Dr. Michael Liebman, Dr. Gerald Lushington, Dr. Stephen Naylor, and Dr. Ratnam Chugaturu. With so many contributors to this article, we'll be talking through their backgrounds at the end of this episode. So now on to the main article, Translational Chemical Biology. Gap Assessment for Advancing Drug Discovery, Development and Precision Medicine, Part 2. Process Chemistry and Root Selection Knowledge of process chemistry is pivotal to activities in the path of a drug from concept to commercialisation. Medicinal chemistry synthesis routes are low-yielding and fraught with capricious reactions, tedious chromatography and scale-up problems. Research by the authors and their collaborators and teams led to development of novel, cost-efficacious, scalable processes for chiral molecules, natural and synthetic. Processes were efficient. Development of new methodologies resulted in more than 100-fold reduction in costs and dramatic increases in reaction efficiencies and yield. These concepts for process chemistry-driven drug discovery have been back integrated into drug discovery methodologies and have led to the discovery of new chemical entities for clinical development. A unique combination of creativity with sophisticated technology, strategic collaboration, global commerce, and refined logistics led to discovery of new drugs. The essential complement of expertise in chemistry and infrastructure facilities, allied with strong institutional linkages built up with various universities and pharmaceutical industry, ensured successful upscaling, seamless technology transfer, and implementation of new technologies. Drug Metabolism – The Case of Cytochrome P450 polypharmacy, involving co-administration of several drugs, is common among the elderly and chronically ill. It is a risk factor for adverse drug reactions and drug-drug interactions, DDI. One plausible DDI occurs when a drug interferes with another, causing irreversible changes to formation of metabolites from one or both. Such suppression or attenuation of metabolism could cause variances in toxicity and efficacy. In humans and other animals, most drugs are metabolized in the liver. Many drug metabolites are formed by oxidative mechanisms catalyzed primarily by heme and cytochrome-containing enzymes. Most biological oxidations involve primary catalysis provided by the cytochrome P450 monooxygenase enzymes. All heme proteins that are activated by hydrogen peroxide, including catalases and ligninases, function via two-electron oxidation of the ferric resting state to an oxoferral porphyrin cation radical. While this oxidation state has yet to be characterized for the cytochromes P450, most of their reactions and those of the biomimetic analogues can be accounted for by oxygen transfer from or to a variety of substrates to give characteristic reactions such as hydroxylation epoxidation, and heteroatom oxidation. Other products resulting from hydroxyl and hydroperoxyl radicals have also been detected. The metabolic processes in vivo contribute in substantial measure to the efficacy, side effects, and also the toxicity of the pharmaceutical entity. These factors are responsible for success or failure of a clinical candidate. Metabolic processes of drugs are always the subject of intense scrutiny in pharmaceutical companies. Pharmacologists have traditionally been involved with isolation and identification of the metabolites of a drug. It is imperative to conduct such studies early in the drug development process. Toxicological and pharmacological studies on the metabolites form a crucial segment in the identification of a clinical candidate. Several problems are currently associated with the use of biological systems in studying drug metabolism. First, in vitro studies produce very small quantities of the product, Primary metabolites are often hydrophilic and difficult to isolate. Most of the reactive metabolites and unstable intermediates are reacted away by the biological nucleophiles. Second, 
Animal studies necessitate the sacrifice of animals and are extremely expensive to conduct. Liver slice preparations are of variable potency. It is difficult to quantitate the precise stoichiometry of the oxidant. Third, pharmacologists do not know in advance the structure of the metabolites they should seek. And fourth, many of the metabolites are not amenable to organic synthesis by conventional routes. Metalloporphyrins as chemical mimics of cytochrome P450 systems. It will be useful to study metalloporphyrins as mimics of the in vivo metabolic processes. Efficient, sterically protected, and electronically activated organic biomimetic catalysts have now been deployed. Early synthetic metalloporphyrins were found to be oxidatively labile. Few catalytic turnovers were seen due to the rapid destruction of the porphyrin macrocycle. Introduction of halogens onto the aryl groups and on the pyrrolic positions of the porphyrins increases the turnover of catalytic reactions by decreasing the rate of porphyrin destruction. The combined electronegatives of the halogen substituents are transmitted to the metal atom, making oxocomplexes more electron deficient and more effective catalysts. Conventional catalysts for oxidation are prone to oxidative dimerization with low catalytic turnover numbers around 5 to 10. These catalysts function with catalytic efficiency, reflecting turnover numbers exceeding 100,000. Structural scaffolds incorporate the azo macrocycle into the primary structure. Further structural variants are affected by modulation of the size of macrocycle, number of rings, the substitution pattern at the periphery of the aromatic rings, the substitution on the internal hydrogens, the metal ions, the choice of axial ligands, the inorganic counterions, and polymers used for immobilization. Diversified analogues through automated oxidation chemistry. Development and implementation of automated oxidation chemistry to obtain diversified analogues, both as new chemical entities in their own right, and also as substrates for further synthetic conversions, hold significant promise. The oxidation procedure is extremely facile, as compared to biochemical and enzymatic processes. This approach affords an efficient method for the systematic preparation and identification of the entire spectrum of metabolites from a chosen drug. One could take a library and create another library of new compounds quite easily and efficiently, relatively low cost, as the starting library is already made, and this would provide new compounds which are more polar, water-soluble, and contain handles for further derivatization. Precision medicine the pharmaceutical industry assumes that drugs developed and marketed against the disease are indeed effective against the entire patient population. However, such is not the case since a particularly disease-targeted drug affords clinical efficacy only in a small fraction of that patient population. The need for translational chemical biology is more than ever in ensuring that the drugs do bring forth therapeutic efficacy to all the patients afflicted with that disease. If not, what is it that differentiates one patient from the other? and what needs to be done to the drug molecule to be effective against the unresponsive patients. The current modus operandi of modern medicine is based on the determination of an individual's symptoms, along with an associated diagnosis and subsequent response to a specific treatment, as compared to a statistically similar and relevant patient population dataset or database. The current healthcare system tends to be reactive, providing treatment post-onset of the disease, with limited attempts at prevention and prediction. All this reliance on the comparative analysis of an individual compared to a defined population tends to neglect and disregard human individuality, complexity and variability. It also fails to recognise the system's level interconnectedness of human molecular biology, biochemistry, metabolism and physiology in the form of systems biology. The lack of progress in the effective diagnosis and treatment of disease as well as a growing awareness of the complexity and variability of individual patients and our limited understanding of causal mechanisms of onset and progression of most 21st century diseases, has led to a growing demand for paradigm change. The clamour for change has led to an emergent growth of P-medicine that includes personalised and precision medicine, and a call for more effective drug discovery and development process that includes translational chemical biology. Precision versus Personalized Medicine The US National Research Council report in 2011 
attempted to define and differentiate precision medicine from personalized medicine. Precision medicine is the tailoring of medical treatment to the individual characteristics of each patient. It does not literally mean the creation of drugs or medical devices that are unique to a patient, but rather the ability to classify individuals into subpopulations that differ in their susceptibility to a particular disease, in the biology and or prognosis of those diseases they may develop, or in their response to a specific treatment. Preventive or therapeutic interventions can then be concentrated on those who will benefit, sparing expense and side effects for those who will not. Although the term personalised medicine is also used to convey this meaning, that term is sometimes misinterpreted as implying that unique treatments can be designed for each individual. For this reason, the committee thinks that the term precision medicine is preferable to personalised medicine to convey the meaning intended in this report. A precision medicine approach utilises individuals and defined subpopulation-based cohorts that have a common knowledge network of disease or health taxonomy. In addition, it requires an integrated molecular and clinical profile of both the individual as well as the subpopulation-based cohort. Zhang has described precision medicine, predicated on the individual, patient or subpopulation model, as one step up from the individual patient focus of personalised medicine. Implicit in this statement is that personalised medicine is based on the single individual, N of 1, model, whereas precision medicine uses a 1 in N model, predicated on widely used biostatistical data analysis and big data analytical tools. Precision medicine can best be described as an amalgam of personalised medicine and modern conventional medicine. Alzheimer's disease, a case study in precision medicine. It was recently suggested that the goal of precision medicine is to deliver optimally targeted and timed interventions tailored to an individual's molecular drivers of disease. As we've already suggested, the utilisation of translational chemical biology and systems biology tools in this type of endeavour is clearly synergistic and can and will facilitate such efforts. However, what specifically can precision medicine provide for patients in the form of safe and effective therapeutic treatments? We will use the minefield of drug discovery and development efforts in Alzheimer's disease, AD, as a focal point for consideration. The fate of AD drug candidates in the drug development process over the past 20 years stands at a remarkable 99.8% failure rate. In addition, the cost of those failures to the pharmaceutical industry has been in excess of $15 billion for amyloid beta trials alone during that same time period. Currently, there are 23 Phase 1, 47 Phase 2, and 18 Phase 3 AD candidate drugs in US clinical trials. However, evaluation of the individual clinical trial drug candidates reveals that the vast majority is focused on individual druggable targets in the amyloid beta or tau pathways. Such specific approaches have already proved to be somewhat futile, and have been compounded by the lack of understanding of AD causal onset as well as the limited application of translational chemical biology. Translational Chemical and Systems Biology Drug Discovery The emergence of systems biology in concert with the development of a suite of accompanying analytical and bioinformatics tools and technologies has facilitated the evaluation and unravelling of complex disease mechanisms. Therefore, it is not surprising that we and others have suggested such an approach should ultimately find widespread use in understanding causal onset, progression, and effective treatment of any complex disease such as AD, Alzheimer's. Recently, we and others have suggested an approach to drug discovery and development for effective and safe AD drugs using a systems biology approach. We have argued that any league drug candidate must disrupt molecular networks that lead to the accumulation of AD neuropathology and trigger the neurodegenerative process that leads to cognitive decline and ultimately to the clinical manifestations of cognitive impairment and dementia due to AD. Note the emphasis on targeting a network as opposed to a single pathway, such as the amyloid beta pathway. Based on Bennett's suggestions, as well as our experiences, we would propose the following broad-based chemical and systems biology approach to drug discovery. 1. Network Biology Discovery Multiomics Analysis at the Gene, Protein and Metabolite Level This should include DNA methylation, miRNA and mRNA 
transcriptomic data from human brain material derived from brain region at the hub of neural networks subserving cognition, as well as AD pathologic and clinical quantitative traits to nominate genes, and therefore proteins, from networks and nodes involved in the molecular pathways leading to Alzheimer's. We were the first group responsible for developing a systems biology methods approach for integrating multi-level omics data, and such approaches are now relatively routine. 2. Identification of potential targets The network biology analysis should provide a prioritised list of target genes. An assortment of analytical tools, primarily employing mass spectrometry, should be used to generate protein expression data, which can be analysed with standard regression techniques, pathway analyses, and structural equation models to provide empirical support for biologic pathways linking proteins to AD endophenotypes. 3. Functional validation Utilisation of RNAi screens to either overexpress or knock down each of the selected genes into neurons. This provides an efficient, high-throughput approach to generating the data required for the analysis of transcriptional networks. RNA profiles derived from each experimental condition will allow the empirical reconstruction of the molecular networks in the target human cell types to confirm the pathways identified in our initial integrative analyses. This component of the pipeline has several purposes. First, it will refine the networks and confirm that the genes nominated in systems biology analysis actually have the expected effects when they are disrupted on an individual basis. Second, it will identify other genes which may be involved in the network because they have similar functional consequences when their expression is perturbed. Third, it will identify transcriptional programs or gene sets that, in vitro, capture aspects of the function of a given pathway and can be used as outcome measures in future drug screening. And finally, fourth, it will also identify nodal points in each network, hubs, for a given pathway that may make particularly effective targets for the disruption of a given cellular pathway. Four, drug candidate screen. Selected prioritised molecular targets that are expressed in the ageing brain and are associated with pathologic and or clinical AD quantitative traits are interrogated with the appropriate chemical or biological library. It is important to note that the experimental pipeline is, by design, driven by empiric observations from the first three stages. This should culminate in the selection of target nodal points for molecular screening which, a priori, were not pre-selected. Bennett has further suggested that any target should be a nodal point in a network related to AD pathology and a clinically quantitative phenotype clearly identified by integrative omic data analysis from human brain tissue. The target must be expressed in the brain and also clearly demonstrated to be related to AD pathology and clinical phenotype. In addition, we would argue that any consideration and scoring of the viability of the target need not simply fit into the amyloid tau or amyloid tau pathway of AD. We believe that the target selection criteria should take into account the system's analysis of the causal onset involving genetics, amyloid plaque, tau tangles, neurovascular and neuroinflammatory events that occur as a function of time. Translational Chemical Biology – The Gap Assessment Science in general, and biomedical sciences specifically, has tended towards reductionism in its efforts to solve complex problems. Although this can provide a series of achievable goals, this goes against the reality that biological systems are exactly that, complex systems exhibiting frequently unpredictable complex behaviours. We can no more take all the elements in a parts list for a digital camera and, putting them in a box, have the result function like a camera, or, having a roster of football players, predict how they will perform in a game. Complexity and systems behaviours are key to enabling function, adaption and survival, but they also work against being highly predictable in most instances. Thus, a significant gap will almost always result when approaching a problem solely from the bottom-up perspective in terms of predicting true systems function, or, in the case of disease, dysfunction, while disassembling a complex system does not guarantee that each subcomponent can be adequately analysed. Optimally, however, a combined, iterative approach could provide the best likelihood for success. Currently, the rapid development and implementation of new technologies, including chemical synthesis, 
has contributed to increasing the size of this gap. The process of data generation and cleaning comprise part of the bottom-up approach, but the ability to translate remains to clinical utility commonly remains elusive because of the lack of understanding the difference between unmet clinical need and unstated unmet clinical need. Why does this gap exist, and how can we effectively close it? As noted earlier in the episode, the focus of most efforts in biomedical research have used a bottom-up approach with the development of technologies, where each provides access to a new but exceedingly narrow window on biological complexity. This leads to a model of the valley of death that includes only discovery, development and regulatory approval, but neglects critical aspects of real-world clinical practice and the complexity of real-world patients. The result is a limited potential to close the gap that translates to clinical utility. Attempts to overcome these gaps with big data are also limited by applying a bottom-up approach because, as W. Edward Deming wrote, if you do not know how to ask the right question, you discover nothing. One of the first steps in framing the right question involves recognising the incomplete understanding of terms that are being commonly used to describe these problems, including translational research, precision medicine, unmet clinical needs, biomarkers, pathways, comparative effectiveness, etc. We will now address several of these concepts, but expand the discussion to include the top-down, patient-physician, perspective, and concerns into what has been primarily a bottom-up definition. Precision medicine. It provides an example of the difference between theory and practice. The NIH definition, from All in US, formerly Precision Medicine Initiative, website, discusses intersection of lifestyle, environment, and genetics to produce new knowledge with the goal of developing more effective ways to prolong health and treat disease. Although a more operational definition is medical care designed to optimize efficiency or therapeutic benefit for particular groups of patients, especially by using genetic or molecular profiling. The two only differ in their apparent emphasis on the use of genetic or molecular profiling to accomplish their goals but neither adequately states the importance of understanding also the clinical history of the patient, which rarely contains complete lifestyle and environmental exposure information. Accurate medicine Very early in a scientist's career, the difference between accuracy and precision is taught. Accuracy is the proximity of measurement results to the true value. Precision is the repeatability or reproducibility of the measurement. Precision in a diagnosis i.e. the concurrence of multiple clinicians, is a laudatory goal, although not always achievable because of limitations in diagnostic guidelines and diagnostic testing and individual clinician experience. Accuracy in a diagnosis can be limited by the reality that patients commonly present with syndromes and or complex disorders that present ambiguity in terms of signs and symptoms and laboratory results. Translational medicine Conventionally, Translational medicine is defined as a rapidly growing discipline in biomedical research that aims to expedite the discovery of new diagnostic tools and treatments by using a multidisciplinary, highly collaborative, bench-to-bedside approach. This goal has unfortunately met with somewhat limited success, as it promotes translation only in one direction, thus ignoring the critical issue, as Deming wrote, of identifying the question first that needs to be addressed. Initiating a bedside-to-bench first step to identify critical clinical needs, presents a higher probability for success transitioning of research results into clinical practice. A first step involves the critical communication of unmet clinical needs and the even greater appreciation of unstated unmet clinical needs. Valley of death. The valley of death conventionally refers to the process involving progression from discovery to regulatory approval costs associated with this process and limited access to adequate funding. At least two opportunities exist that can change this dynamic. Firstly, two key considerations that impact potential clinical and commercial value are namely, will the physician prescribe the medication? And will the patient take the medication as prescribed? Failure to incorporate these considerations adequately in early planning and evaluation of drug target development can lead to clinical trial success and approval at great expense but even greater commercial failures. The second opportunity that can change the dynamic is front-loading investment into better understanding of the disease process, real-world clinical practice, and complexity of real-world patients, 
and result in more directed, smaller, and shorter clinical trials. This reduces overall development cost, but, more importantly, can extend the lifetime of the drug for revenue generation under patent protection, even if the total population may be reduced. Clinical trial data versus clinical data. Simply put, patients who are enrolled in clinical trials, i.e. meet the inclusion-exclusion criteria, rarely reflect the real-world population and are selected to optimise results of efficacy and minimise side effects. It is well recognised that most patients have multiple comorbid conditions, previously treated or currently being treated or as yet diagnosed, as well as associated polypharmacy, including over-the-counter products. These real-world patients are not typically enrolled in clinical trials, yet confront the clinician and impact accuracy in diagnosis and response to treatment. Most current diagnostic and treatment guidelines, however, do not adequately incorporate these factors in their development. Drug safety. Drug safety is typically considered in preclinical studies and focuses on dosing, toxicology, and potential for notable side effects. Ongoing debate exists about the use and adequacy of animal testing models in reflecting human response, and significant failure of these models to replicate human response is widely known. New testing paradigms are a major area of development, including stem cells, and also integration of computational modeling of systems biology. Of note, however, is the increasing interest in potentially accelerating the administration of drugs, post-safety evaluation, into humans, rather than following current regulatory procedures. It will be critical to consider how to enhance safety screening to incorporate aspects of precision medicine that should consider heterogeneity in the target population and differences in diagnostic guidelines, pre-existing conditions, and likely concurrent medications. This will present significant challenges to the development of new preclinical screening methods and procedures. Comparative Effectiveness, CER CER involves direct comparison of existing healthcare interventions to determine which work best for which patients and which pose the greatest benefits and harms. The focus here is, however, on comparative efficacy. To truly consider effectiveness of an intervention, it is critical to consider if, upon regulatory approval, a physician will utilise or prescribe the intervention, difficulties in being incorporated into professional guidelines, and whether a patient will appropriately follow a physician's recommendation. A drug that is efficacious but not prescribed or taken by the patient is not effective. Biomarkers There is a tendency to overutilize biomarkers as surrogates for functional response. Acceptance without adequate validation is one problem because of the noted lack of reproducibility that has become too common in the published literature. In addition, the vast number of published biomarkers present significant challenges to identifying and evaluating the potential value of an individual or set of biomarkers. George Post, in a frequently misquoted article, wrote that as of 2011, there were 150,000 published articles on biomarkers with less than 100 being used clinically. This is often misquoted as indicating 150,000 biomarkers rather than publications. We have analysed a subset of only the oncology literature and found that there were 42,440 studies for which 38,426 biomarkers were observed. Of these, 24 were EMEA approved, 30 were FDA approved, where 23 were approved by both agencies. Of these, a very limited subset has proven to be commercially successful. The enhanced sensitivity of new analytic methods will require significant advances in the processes for biomarker validation. Even diagnostic test results can be misleading, particularly when different methods are used to measure the same marker. For HER2 NOI determination in breast cancer, both IHC, immune histochemistry, and fluorescent in situ hybridization are approved, but one measures protein expression levels and other measures gene copy number. These processes are not equivalent, and in large studies where both tests are administered, approximately 22% discordance exists. A common limitation in current translational research is using biomarkers as targets when they only show correlative relationship to disease, not causal. Comorbidities As noted previously, 
Real-world patients rarely present with a single, isolated disease, but with comorbid conditions that may have been treated, concurrent or as yet undiagnosed. In addition, each patient is dealing with a polypharmacy situation that may extend to 15 medications, plus over-the-counter and dietary treatments, as well as variability in adherence to prescribed dosing. This complexity, as we have observed, is apparent in the analysis of nationalised healthcare data, i.e. a unified patient-based health record, and reflects the reality that physicians may not fully utilise such data because of the limitations in existing guidelines, their personal experience and or patient pressure. The impact on quality of diagnosis, response to clinical testing, and to treatment can be readily appreciated, but reflect limitations when attempting to apply highly refined molecular methods to diagnose or assess individual patients. Compliance Compliance considers the clinician's tendency to follow established clinical guidelines and protocols. Guidelines are frequently developed by professional societies but rarely consider the complexity of real patients in terms of likely comorbid conditions and medications, except those that have been noted to present significant side effects and contradictions. Since randomised clinical trials are considered the highest level of evidence for the development of evidence-based guidelines, it should be noted that typical inclusion-exclusion criteria limit the presence of comorbid conditions and many additional drugs that a patient may be taking. Separately, Many guidelines are developed as consensus guidelines and thus not be uniformly consistent in their quality and support by the developers across their multiple elements of decision support. And finally, physicians recognise that with such deficiencies, guidelines are only guidelines and frequently practised based on personal and personally shared experience, for example, off-label prescribing. Adherence Patient adherence to prescribed drug or treatment regimes is acknowledged to cost at least $300 billion annually in the United States because of failures in adequate disease management and the need for hospital readmission. In addition, there is loss of prescription value to pharma and biotechs. Most efforts to improve adherence focus on monitoring patient behaviour post-prescription filing and or reminders and counselling. These attempts to apply technology may miss the critical issue involving individual patient behaviours that may start at the time of disease diagnosis and communication with the physician, patient's perception of risk of disease versus risk from medications, patient preferences and concerns about impact on lifestyle factors, such as impotency or appearance. These observations should emphasise the need to include psychosocial and cultural factors into models that represent patient progression through the entire disease process and interaction with the healthcare ecosystem. Diagnosis As noted previously, accuracy in diagnosis is critical, and also potentially one of the most critical factors in patient management, and successful development of new drugs and interventions. Physician evaluation of a patient needs to establish a more accurate diagnosis than currently available in terms of disease stratification by evaluating progression of multiple clinical parameters over time determining how far along this complex disease trajectory a patient has progressed, so their disease stage and how quickly they are progressing, i.e. disease velocity. A late-stage, slow-moving disease may be treated very differently from one exhibiting early-stage, aggressive progression. These factors are of particular value in dealing with current diagnosis involving syndromes rather than specific diseases. Disease state versus disease trajectory as noted, disease is a process that evolves over time, other than the initial impact of trauma, and needs to incorporate temporal processes to better diagnose and manage outcomes. In addition, in chronic diseases, for example diabetes and Alzheimer's, it is critical to recognise that the patient will be undergoing physiological changes in normal development throughout the disease course, and it may be critical to deconvolute the influences of each to be able to provide for the best diagnosis, treatment and outcome. Unmet clinical need, unstated unmet clinical need. While it is obvious that fundamental and discovery, research, can best impact healthcare by addressing unmet clinical need, it is important to understand how to identify and validate that need. The current pressures and practices in healthcare 
present the clinician with little opportunity to explore the needs of their practice much beyond what addresses daily operational issues. This challenge is amplified with both the rapid development and commercialization of new technologies for diagnosis and treatment, as well as an exploding and frequently inadequately vetted generation of research publications. As Henry Ford wrote, if I had asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. In initiating research into the development of new solutions to clinical problems, it is critical to go beyond the simple question of what do you need? In extension to the discussion about HER2 NOI testing mentioned previously, we can examine triple negative breast cancer, where HER2, ER and PR testing produces negative results. Variability in HER2 testing was noted, but also differences in ER and PR testing exists, along with variation among hospitals and laboratories in establishing threshold values for plus negatives in such tests. While it might be expected that three negative tests would be an easy discriminator for establishing a diagnosis, this is not the case, and may naturally interfere with additional testing and analysis that relies on consistency of that diagnosis. And while it might be suggested that further genomic and or molecular markers observed in tissue could enhance the diagnosis and potential stratification, it is worth noting that significant heterogeneity has been observed and classified in breast cancer tissue, yielding discernible patterns that can confound the conventional diagnoses, and more recently have been associated with a high degree of variability in patient response to targeted therapeutics. Concluding Remarks we have tried in this article to initiate discussion about the complexities that face drug development, patient management and healthcare beyond their current horizons. It presents a perspective that current basic research could benefit from understanding the reality of the multiple hierarchical systems that impact the translation of laboratory results into utility and clinical practice. These systems operate at the molecular, personal, society and population levels but do not function independently of their interactions across these levels. We propose innovative network science that addresses the general need for improved compound diversity for a variety of applications in bioscience and translational chemical biology. The approach applies a combination of natural product isolation, synthesis, diversification, automated purification and structure analysis. Such programs can draw upon the highly complementary expertise and resources of leading academic and industrial research teams. From foundation to capstone, any translational endeavour exemplifies a pyramidal enterprise. In all cases, an extensive knowledge base yields a narrower subset of opportunities that are subsequently honed and winnowed down to a single critical new capability. This structure applies regardless of whether one is translating from general scientific understanding to broad health principles, from specialised chemical biology to a specific new drug, or beyond this, from patient-specific omics data toward precision medicine, or from broad health records toward optimal medical outcomes. While we can appreciate how translational chemical biology will contribute to improving patient management and reducing healthcare costs in the short term, we believe that only through the development and evaluation of models of the true complexity of the healthcare ecosystem, real-world clinical practice and real-world patients, will long-term benefits be realised. Again, correlation does not infer causality, and modelling cause and effect will be required to create new systems for research, translation and delivery of improved healthcare. We need to also understand that simply asking a clinician what they need will not necessarily result in understanding what the real need may be. Physicians are accustomed to working with what they have to address, critical issues on a daily basis, and not on exploring either the limitations that may exist or the potential for developing new approaches. To really understand unmet clinical need requires an immersion in observing and modelling the clinical process. These models can serve as the basis for asking more directed questions and gaining the confidence and access to the experience of the physician in revealing their perceptions about what really works and what does not. This article was written by Dr. Makun Chogard, Dr. Michael Liebman, Dr. Gerald Lushington, Dr. Stephen Naylor and Dr. Ratnam Chugaturu. The authors of this article and this episode would like to thank their many colleagues who have influenced them in innumerable ways over the years, and for being the beneficiary of their collective wisdom. And now onto the backgrounds of the authors of this article. 
Dr. Mukund Chogard is a serial entrepreneur, president and chief scientific officer of Think Pharma and Think Discovery. He has had adjunct research professor, visiting fellow, scientists appointments at Harvard, MIT, Princeton, Cambridge, Caltech, University of Chicago, Northwestern and Strathclyde. He directed research groups at Dow Chemicals, Abbott, Cytomed and Genzyme. His current research interests are in traditional medicine-derived new chemical entities and the discovery of the new chemosynthetic livers with utility in drug metabolism, valorization of biomass and environmental remediation. Dr. Michael Liebman is the Managing Director of IPQ Analytics LLC and Strategic Medicine Inc. After serving as the Executive Director of the Windbur Research Institute from 2003 to 2007, Michael is Chair of the Informatics Program and also Chair of Translational Medicine and Therapeutics for the Pharma Foundation. He serves on several scientific advisory boards, including the International Society for Translational Medicine. Dr. Gerald Lushington, an avid collaborator, focuses primarily on applying simulations, visualization and data analysis techniques to help extract physiological insight from structural biology data and relate physical attributes of small bioactive molecules, drugs, metabolites, toxins, towards physiological effects. Most of his 150 plus publications have involved work with experimental, molecular and biomedical scientists covering diverse pharmaceutical and biotechnology applications. Dr. Stephen Naylor is the founder and CEO of Reneurogen LLC, a virtual pharmaceutical company developing precision medicine therapies for the treatment of stroke. In addition, he is the founder, chairman and CEO of My Health Inc., a systems network biology level diagnostics company in the health and wellness and precision medicine sector. He was also the founder, CEO, and chairman of Predictive Physiology and Medicine, PPM, Inc., one of the world's first personalized medicine companies. Dr. Ratnam Chukaturu is the innovation czar, founder, and CEO of IDD Partners, a non-profit think tank focused on pharmaceutical innovation, and most recently, Deputy Site Head, Center for Advanced Drug Research, SRI International. He has more than 35 years of experience in academia and industry, managing new lead discovery projects and forging collaborative partnerships with academia, disease foundations, non-profits and government agencies. He is the founding president of the International Chemical Biology Society, a founding member of the Society for Biomolecular Sciences and editor-in-chief emeritus of the journal Combinational Chemistry and High Throughput Screening. If you've enjoyed this extra long set of episodes from Drug Discovery World, then you can subscribe to the journal and get the latest issues delivered to you via post or electronically, completely free of charge. Subscribing to the journal is the only way to get the full articles from the latest issue. Just head to ddwonline.com and you can subscribe there. You can also read further articles and view the original PDFs of past articles, including this one, which will include extra content, figures and images. You can find all of this in our PDF archive. If you've enjoyed the podcast and found it useful, then as always, please do subscribe and leave us a review. And you can also follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter for updates on latest articles and news. Thanks again for listening, and we hope to see you in our next episode.